Thank you again, Dr. Megan. Can I call you Dr. Megan? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about you so people who don't know you, say they could get a little familiar with you. Well, you know, originally I'm from Paris, France. We moved here to the United States when I was a little girl. Um, otherwise, I would say that since around the age of 10, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Now, my path has been a little more twisted, as in I did go to interview at conventional medical schools. But and over time, they really led me to understand that I was not going to learn the kind of medicine that I really wanted to learn, which is not that people have to stay sick forever, that once you have a disease, you always have a disease. I don't believe that. I think you do have to stop hurting the body in the ways, whatever it is, if it's heavy metals, if it's mental, emotional, physical, whatever. You have to stop whatever is making you sick. And then you have to give the body what it needs, vitamins and minerals to then heal. But the body will always try to heal unless it's overwhelmed and then it can't do it. So when I was going to these other medical school interviews, then I realized they don't believe that way in conventional medicine. They don't believe that you can heal. And so finally I got really discouraged with that. And then uh, back in, I think it was December 2005, is when I re or six, is when I realized that wasn't gonna work. And so then I started working around and I saw that there are some schools for naturopathic medicine. Now those are exactly the same as conventional medical schools. It's still a four year program after graduation from college. But in fact, it's more than four years it's really like six years that they put into four because you have to take all the natural classes along with all the regular medical classes, just, you know, all the ologies and, you know, all that stuff. So it's more than that. But I, but in addition to that, you learn how to help the body to heal using a lot of natural therapies. And so that was just what I wanted. And I'm very happy that I got to do that. Mm -hmm. So tell me, um, how does it go on your daily basis as a doctor? When a patient comes to you, how does it work? Okay. Well, I am actually a gastroenterologist, which is a doctor that specializes in the digestive system. Now, remember, as a naturopathic doctor, doctor we are taught to look at the whole body, mind, body, and spirit. But I just pick a specialty because that's what I love. Now, when they first arrive though, let's say my patients typically have a burpee, bloaty, gassy, or anything else nasty issue, right? Like vomiting or nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. So when they first come to me, what I usually do, go through their paperwork, which is 12 pages. Then I go through their life story. I start from zero with their mother's pregnancy to when, however old they are now. Okay, that's their life. And I'm always looking for any major factors like births or deaths, marriages, divorces, big career changes, moves from state to state or country to country, you know, anything that would adversely affect their health. And then I have them send me all of the lab work that they may have done already with other professionals. Now, if they've not done basic lab work, then we order that too, basic lab work. And then I may say, well, let's do a specialty test, like either a stool sample or food sensitivity test maybe a gastric acid production test. It's called the Heidegger. So maybe I do that, okay? And then after I've looked at, you know, their life story, their first visit forms and, uh, and, and their lab work, then that's how I come up with what their plan, what their problem is and what the plan is gonna be. Their plan always includes nutrients, fluids, like making teas and drinking those. I pick the herbs. And then um, it also includes um, a supplements, home therapies, and if it's necessary, I will also refer them to a specialist. For example, a person that's been in a motorcycle accident may have a lot of physical challenges. Well, I am only, I'm not a chiropractor, and so I may refer them to a chiropractor or to a cranial sacral therapist or something similar, whatever I think will be helpful for them. And that's how I do it. And usually it takes about three visits, two visits to get up and going and one follow-up visit. And after that, they can just continue on their plan and just check in with them from me, me from time to time. Yeah, that's how it goes. Well, thank you. Also, 
as we, the group is about holistic approach to hair, my thought is, you know, everything works together. As you mentioned, your, whatever you put in your body has an effect to it. And as your focus being the gut, how, what is your perspective on how the hair grow and how a client who's dealing with a lot of danger, because lately it's been my concern with my client, they have issue with their okay. scalp having a lot of danger and having a lot of flakes. What would you recommend for somebody like that? Well, Jadon, there is a very close correlation between gut health and not just nails, but your skin and your hair, because the gut is really where health and disease begin. So if a person has a lot of dandruff, the first thing, honestly, that comes to mind is they are probably not taking enough fish oils. Usually when people have done studies and when people don't have enough fish oil, they tend to get a lot of earwax, like they can't hear, and they can have a lot of dandruff too. So I would say with a person dealing with a high dandruff situation, you're not going to want to wash your hair more or less. You're not going to want to put hair oil. No, because you need to work from the inside. So what I'd say is make sure that you're eating properly for your blood type and also get enough fish oils as a supplement. And I think after that, once you correct all that, you should not have as much danger no more. So but while you recommend fish oil, uh, what is it about the fish oil that you think is causing the danger? Because from my understanding from cosmetology school, it talks about how it could be either for fungus or over build up over you know, the body started to produce a lot of skin for some people and it looks like dangerous. So what do you think? What, why fish oil? Okay. And yeah, I'm not saying that the, the cause of the danger could be that because of a fungus producing, then their the melanin in their skin, everything hyper enters into hyper production. Uh, that could still be true. But what we've seen is when people take enough fish oils, they are usually not so dry. Now, how it works exactly, I have no idea. <laughs> but I can tell you what fish oils do. They are anti-inflammatory, first of all. So it's any inflammation reason that your head is producing all this Andrew dandruff. Well, impl- essential fatty acids, fish oils, omega-3s, they will decrease inflammation. They also stabilize the membrane of the cell. And even your hair has follicles. They have cells. And so it helps to stabilize the follicle. So it could be that aspect. Also, a fish oil is also an anticoagulant. So if a person is having a really dry head, not because of fungus, but because made their blood flow in general in their body is not good, so that the nutrients they need to get to the head cannot get there because it's clogged up in their blood, well, then fish oils are a natural anticoagulant. So like I said, that's the three of the ways that they're good. But honestly, I don't know why they work. I just know that they do. <laughs> well, those yeah. are really good. Um, it makes sense with what you said, as you mentioned, inflammatory, right. you know. Yeah. But I, that's some good advice. And yeah. what do you think of allergy too? Because sometimes I see some clients who have some allergy reaction to the food they eat and some of them don't even know that they're allergic to a lot of stuff so would you say it could be a lot of allergies that Mm -hmm. they are not I would and to be honest there's there's two different kinds of allergies there are allergies that are basically purely environmental that means you're allergic to pollen and and to trees flowering and things like that then there are the internal digestive and allergies such as you're allergic to dairy or soy or wheat or corn. Those are the top allergens, peanut butter maybe. So the point that I usually tell people, if they're trying to figure out which allergy they have, is they really do need to pay attention. When does it flare up? Do they start sneezing? Is their nose dribbling? Is there fluid going down the back of their throat? Or is it a pain like abdominal pain? Or they start bloating gas? They need to really pay attention to what they have. And the best way that I suggest they do that, if they think it might be internal and not trees, is that they do a diet diary. Again, a diet diary is a tool that I use. And on there, it has a space for six days. 
and three meals a day, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then what I do is I have people write down what time they ate, not just what they ate, but what time. And then what they ate, if it was home cooked, excuse me, if it was home cooked or store bought is important. And what size was it like 12 ounce, six ounce, et cetera. And then also in that diet diary, I have a column for bowel movements. What were their bowel movements like that day? Are they constipated? Did they go more often than they usually do? Is it very hard and dry? All that is important, and what time they went. And also the last thing on that paper, there is a symptom column. And then I want them to write down at what time they had those symptoms. So then it's a really good way for me to be able to see and correlate between what they ate and the symptoms they had at what time. And I've been able to, without a food sensitivity test, you know, tell people you don't do well with dairy. Like this one kid I had, he was, um, I think, two years old. And he used to wake up in the morning crying because he had no energy to get out of bed. A two-year-old with no energy, if you can believe that. And he would cry. So somebody would go and pick him up. And then he would get to the breakfast table and not want to eat because he said stomach's still hurting from last night's dinner. Okay? And then in, during the day, he would not want to play with his brother. Now, usually, you know, kids don't want to play. You know it's serious. Now, they may not want to go to school, but they may not want to go to school because they're being bullied. They don't like the teacher. They think it's boring or whatever. But if they don't want to play, then you know they're sick, right? So he would not want to play, just put his head down in, at home. Okay, the mom was a stay-at-home mom. Anyway, I think the, old, the oldest boy is eight and then six and then two. Okay, so then finally, when I looked at his diet diary and I noticed, I said, you know what? I think he's allergic to dairy. You know, I don't think that normal. It's kind of uncommon because that's not common in white people, and he was white. But I said, I think he's allergic to dairy. He's not processing this. So I gave them some options. I said, let's take dairy out of their diet and not just milk for cereal. I mean, everywhere, I mean, flour, bread, all that is just trying to take dairy out, okay? And you can substitute it with other things, almond milk or, you know, hemp milk or whatever. Well, she did that. And she, I don't remember how much time was it, maybe two or three weeks. I can't remember. It was a very short time. And he just bounced back. She said he started eating them out of the house and oh, He was running everywhere playing with his brother. And so, yeah, that's just an example of what a diet diary. You mentioned about the boy being allergic to dairy and seeing a difference in his um, energy when he took dairy out of his diet. Right. And Correct. that is that's so true. true. Mm -hmm. Because I had the same issue. Well, I don't have any problem with dairy. My biggest issue is more... Oh, did you? Yes. Okay. His issue is he's allergic to dairy and um, peanuts and all that. Okay. And you see a difference. In oh, wow. Dairy. But my issue is more starch, like potatoes, okay. anything that turns into sugar, right. carb, is mm -hmm. something exactly. I need to stay away yeah. from, any, which brings yeah, the energy down. So, yeah. yes, I truly agree with whatever you eat and whatever's going on in your gut makes a difference in your hair. So, I, it does, yeah. Well, thank you for mm -hmm. taking the time to speak with us. Anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I know you're welcome. Now, there's a couple of companies out there that once they make sure that their digestion is on point, that they can look into as far as quality hair care products. But for right now, I say your main focus, make sure you're eating what you should drinking enough water, half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you need to drink 100 ounces of the water minimal a day, okay? And make sure you're taking the supplements. And once you give your body everything it needs, you'll find that you won't have any more hair problems like dandruff or your hair won't grow or it's brittle or anything like that, yeah. Because you got to take care of the inside first. Yeah. And last thing. Stress, you you mentioned about you looking at the whole body, stress level, how stress has an effect on your hair. And I have a client, she mentioned to me that, you know, 
when she look at her family, they all have the same issue with the middle part being balding. I mean, as far as less hair. Oh, does okay. he have a genetic aspect to it, or is it more of a personal issue that's going on with the whole entire family? What do you think about it? Now, as far as you related the stress and the hair loss, well, overall, you need to understand that stress, the stress hormone is produced, called the stress hormone is called cortisol, and it's produced by your adrenal glands. The adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys. Okay, there's two of them. And now, whenever you're under stress for whatever means, mental or emotional stress or physical stress, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you're under stress, your body will produce cortisol. And if it's elevated, it can narrow your blood vessel, make your blood pressure go higher, and eventually you could have a heart attack or a stroke. So the point is, though, when it comes to stress and alopecia, alopecia is hair loss, okay? And you can have it central, like in the middle, in the frontal, or in the back, okay? But alopecia is hair loss. Now, if the person sees that they have increasing alopecia or hair loss, then what they, again, should first do is not run to the hair doctor and pay for a lot of expensive treatments. What they need to do is figure out what is going on with their body. Are they too stressed? Are they eating well? Are they drinking well? They've got to do all that. Sleeping well. If sleep is another stressor. If you fall asleep and you don't stay asleep or you wake up tired, you may not be sleeping well. And that alone can cause your cortisol to go up. And again, narrowing your blood vessels and slowing your digestion. And now that your digestion is slow, you don't get the vitamins, minerals that you need. You see the vicious circle. Thank you so much for the information. We had some issue with the connection, but the information is still valuable. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly okay. appreciate it. And I will definitely send out some people to you if they need more information. That sounds good. Thank sounds you. Good. Enjoy your day. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm welcome. I'm happy to do it again, okay? Okay. Or on another topic even, okay. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you.